The information provided by Taming Lightning is designed to provide helpful information and to educate on the subjects discussed. The information provided is true and complete to the best of our knowledge and is not intended to be used without professional guidance and supervision. All recommendations are made without guarantee on part of Taming Lightning and affiliates. Taming Lightning and affiliates disclaim any liability in connection with the use of this information. This episode is sponsored by the Pittsburgh Foundation and the Heinz Endowment in reception of the Advancing Black Arts in Pittsburgh grant and residency hosted by the Pittsburgh Glass Center. The city of Pittsburgh is known for its rich contributions to the canon of black cultural creativity. Cultural experience and creative innovations have always reflected the expressions and imaginations of people from the African diaspora. The Advancing Black Arts in Pittsburgh program is where access and opportunity connect with the Pittsburgh artists who are thriving in their creative process as a means and a way of life. Advancing Black Arts in Pittsburgh is a joint grant-making program created and managed through the partnership between the Pittsburgh Foundation and the Heinz Endowments. The program is committed to helping create a vibrant cultural life in Pittsburgh and the region. Taming Lightning is supported by the Pittsburgh Glass Center, who encouraged my exploration, research, and development of a space for plasma and neon sculpture. The Pittsburgh Glass Center is a nonprofit, public access school, gallery, and state of the art glass studio dedicated to teaching, creating, and promoting glass art. World renowned artists come from all over to make glass art. People interested in learning more about glass come here to take classes, explore contemporary art gallery, and watch live glass demonstrations. As one of the top glass art centers in the world, we pride ourselves on providing exceptional resources and instruction to expand the skills and knowledge of our students and artists. We strive to foster a new generation of glass artists and enthusiasts here in the Pittsburgh region. The Pittsburgh Glass Center is an important arts organization in Pittsburgh that is helping the city connect its history as a major producer in glass to its creative future through the innovative use of glass as art. Glass art. We teach it, we create it, we promote it. We support those who make it. If you're interested in plasma and want to get hands-on experience with this unique medium, I will be teaching two classes at PGC this summer along with Ed Kirshner and Pat Collentine. From June 22nd to the 26th of 2020, Ed and myself will run the Plasma Vessels Using Glass Solder class, where you can learn how to use the unique soldering technique to repurpose existing glass objects into beautiful plasma artworks. This class is open to all skill levels, from beginner to expert. And from August 3rd through the 7th, with Pat, we will be teaching the class It's All About the Light, a class for beginners exploring and expanding ways to make vessels for plasma in the hot shop. A quick update on the workshops offered at Pittsburgh Glass Center this summer. Currently, the Ed Kirshner class, Plasma Vessels Using Glass Solder, is full, and the Hot Shop class, It's All About the Light, has five seats remaining. At the release of this episode, summer workshops are still set to run, and you may still register for those classes. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, there are bound to be new updates as things progress. With this in mind, please hold off on booking your flights and hotels, and keep your eyes peeled for updates by visiting the website. For more information, please check us out on the web at www.pittsburghglasscenter.org or call our studio at 412-365-2145. Taming Lightning is affiliated with the Plasma Art Alliance, which formed in 2017 during the exhibition The Arts of Plasma at MONA, the Museum of Neon Art. Their mission is to promote the illuminated plasma in glass as a sculptural art medium foster public awareness for this art form through exhibitions, conferences, and educational art reach, and support the exchange of information related to techniques and technologies essential to the advancement of the field. PAA will serve the growing interest in this evolving art for the mutual benefit of artists, enthusiasts, and patrons. If you're interested or would like to join, you can find them on the web at www.plasmaartalliance.com. I'd like to mention a support option for Taming Lightning, which is coffee. That's ko-fi.com slash Taming Lightning. 
With this, you're basically donating or giving a tip at the cost of a $3 cup of coffee based on how you think I'm doing. And if you like the project, it's nice to support it. Your donation goes directly to the podcast for means of assisting with audio equipment upgrades, billing or hosting, software and services used in processing the audio, and future travel and professional content. You are by no means obligated to donate, but any support, including commenting and sharing, is appreciated. Welcome back or welcome to the Taming Lightning Podcast. I'm Percy Eccles II. I'm the creator and host of Taming Lightning, as well as the Emerging Plasma Tech at Pittsburgh Glass Center. Taming Lightning Podcast features a series of conversations to help expand our understanding of plasma and neon light, looking beyond its associations with novelty and sign making, and to explore the potential for noble gases as an artistic medium. The intro is Boost by Joachim Karud. Joachim is a Swedish artist who loves to produce chill and happy music and does so for copyright free use. Be sure to support his music by giving credit when used, subscribing, and or by donation. You can find him on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify. Hello, Lightning Tamers. This is episode number 24. In today's podcast, we have Cork Marketsky, whose background is numerous, whether it be in the fine arts, sculpture, music, film, writing, neon, or plasma. His diverse use of materials in his artwork are often accompanied and are influenced by light. And during my trip to the Bay Area in January, I asked Patrick Collentine, a former student of Cork and whom I instructor was for plasma, for an introduction. I was then invited to meet him at his studio, and when I arrived, I was greeted very warmly, and we began our conversation. So it looks like it's good so far. Okay. Um, so on today's podcast, I have, uh, how do you pronounce your Cork? Markeski. Markeski. I don't know why I want to pronounce it differently, but. Well, because it looks like <laughs> Mark Cheshi. Or, yeah, right. yeah. Yeah, yeah. But in Italian, the C-H is a K. Ah, uh huh. Yeah, so I, I'm here as part of my little trip uh, to the journey to the West, I suppose, where I kind of got an opportunity to uh, give you a call through through Pat and, and meet you here in person and check out your place. And I do appreciate you taking the time here. Oh, it, the timing was perfect. Okay, excellent. Um, so, in, on my podcast, I usually ask uh, specifically on the subject of neon or plasma. Uh, how that came about in someone's process. So someone like yourself who's done music, broadcasting, uh, architectural design, or uh, public art, I guess, is more public art sculpture. It, it may be a, a lot of things. Uh, how did you come into the space of neon? And did you also do plasma? I think I heard something about that as well. Like you were a yeah, kind of forebearer for that. Did my first, showed my first plasma piece in 1968. And uh, but I mean it, it. It started with my interest in fine art. So it all I was taking classes at the College of San Mateo, uh, predominantly to avoid the draft. This was the Vietnam War, uh, and so I just started and was in broadcasting. And I had a band, so I was taking music classes and a pottery class and ended up having um, a survey class on art history. And the teacher was really quite brilliant and introduced us to Dadaism. And specifically, Kurt Schwedder's W poem, Mm -hmm. uh, which was, I think, like 1917. He uh, had a stenciled letter W, about two feet square, that he held above his head and from the top of a table in a cabaret, shouted, whispered, screamed, hollered, completely intoned 250 times in a different way, the letter W, Hmm. and then pronounced it the greatest poem ever written. (laughs) And um, it was my eureka moment. I completely understood that. 
I knew what that was, and I knew that's what I wanted to do with my life. And from that day, it was fine arts classes, um, library, bookstores, collect everything I could, specifically on uh, the modernists from 1900, um, well, all the way through what, what was happening at that moment in time, mm. which was the beginning of pop art, the uh, sort of end of abstract expressionism. There was also a show that had just happened, was about to happen, and that really turned me on, which was the Explorations in Kinetic Art at the University of California Museum. A wonderful show done by Peter Sells, uh, Jean Tingley, um, uh, Hans Hacke, Len Lai, amazing pieces. And I probably went 10 to 12 times. Mm -hmm. And again, there's something about it that, you know, it was an itch. I mean, it's like meeting somebody that becomes a friend versus an acquaintance. There was something there that was really worth going back to. And I started doing little mechanical pieces, um, taking Christmas tree lights and putting them behind a, a lamp crystal that would rotate. I mean, just really primitive, simple things, uh, de developing skills. Mm -hmm. And then as far as the first experience with plasma, uh, it had to do with being at my girlfriend, Leah Smith's house, watching television. And in those days, there was a, a fear that if you watch TV in the dark, it would somehow bother your eyes, hurt your eyes. Mm -hmm. So we had TV lamps. And the TV lamp was usually a gooseneck thing that sat on top of a television set and just made a little ambient light. Mm -hmm. Well, this one had two, I'm going to say 14-inch long, half-inch diameter fluorescent tubes. Mm -hmm. But they were turned off. And I could swear... I was seeing a flicker from the bulbs. And I took one of the bulbs out and just held it in my hand, and I was getting flashes. Hmm. And I put it close to the screen of the set, and it glowed. <laughs> Completely turned me on. And I just thought, this is, I've got to do something with this. So I was already smart enough, even though this was, I was, what was I, 19 years old, to know you never tell anyone you're doing something for an art project. I went to Gum Street Electronics in San Mateo. I brought an old black and white television set that a friend of ours had had in their garage um, and told a guy, I want this particular component. Now, the way that I got to that component was in my mom's place, put on a pair of rubber gloves, taped one of the fluorescent tubes to the front of the TV set, got behind the TV set, turned it on, and every time I cut a wire and the light went out, I would reconnect that wire until there was nothing left except for this gigantic flyback transformer. And so at Gum Street, they removed the flyback transformer and just made it operate as a solo object. And I told them it was for a physics class. And they could get on with a physics class, but I knew better, as I said. Yeah. Never tell them it's for art. <laughs> that's smart. And that's when I, I really started playing with it and produced some of my um, first pieces. Um, one of the pieces I still show, it. it it took me from 1968 to 1974 to complete it mm -hmm. because I could see it, but I couldn't get the glass vessel prepared the way I wanted it until mm -hmm. then. And how how'd you, and by trying to get that prepared, you mean getting the right shape or finding out someone that, did you have someone fabricate that? Or was that, was that you? No, this was, um, I mean, my, I'm, I'm not much of a, I really like, things that exist more than necessarily having to m make them mm -hmm. and uh, with this I can actually show you a little later this little flyback transformer it was just sitting on the table and I 
had gathered anything I could to put close to it to see what would and what wouldn't glow. And there was an eight-foot fluorescent tube. And that eight-foot fluorescent tube started to produce rings of light. So a dark ring and an illuminated ring, and a dark ring and an illuminated ring, and wherever the energy entered is where this very slowly, beautifully hypnotic flow of light and darkness would go. And by simply adjusting the tube, you could get it so that it would taper to a point and disappear right at the tip of the bulb. Huh. And what I wanted was that white phosphor gone in that tube. Mm -hmm. So you could actually see the light. So in 1974, I was being represented in Toronto, Canada by the Electric Gallery, which was actually the Howard Weiss Gallery from New York, transplanted to um, Toronto. And they asked me if I would like to design sets for the Canadian Broadcasting Company for um, a French-Canadian singer named Charlebois and then the American magician, Doug he Hennings, Hemmings. Okay. And I instantly thought, this is going to be a way that I can get the tubes that I want. So I said, I'd be glad to do it, but I'm going to need 800 eight-foot-long clear fluorescent tubes. And I know that the Voltark company would be happy to do this for you. They just have to remove the tube from one station and put it into the next. So I got 800 fluorescent tubes, 20 sent to me at my home, mm -hmm. and the others were all in Canada. And with those 20, I made a number of pieces. Uh, and I can you know, show you a little video of what they actually look like. Mm -hmm. And then I did a huge sculpture for them with all of these hanging fluorescent tubes. Because they were clear, they could have cameras above them and ah. turn them off and actually just shoot through. And then I use these very large rheostats and just bring the power up on the neon transformers until they actually just started to carry a standing wave. <laughs> it, was, it was really slick. It was fun. Yeah. So like when you're making the work that you make, you're, you're, you're using what's already there and, and enhancing that. Yeah, what's already you're basically bringing out what's in in the work itself, the, what the objects are there. Yeah, I, I was working with um, the little any two bulbs. Um, so any two bulbs look like um, a jelly bean, a little smaller than a jelly bean, and uh, it has two wires that go into two little anodes, and it puts out maybe a half watt to a quarter watt of light and they were traditionally used in night lights before electroluminescence um, and most you probably recognize them from being inside of a light switch the light switch itself a little handle oh. glows orange yeah yeah that's what it yeah. is so I, I bought 35 or 40 of these things and just put them in a little wooden box and set that over this radio frequency so you transform it, and they, they have a fair amount of resistance because there's not a lot of volume. But when you come in contact with them, they just pop with light. And you sort of stir it like a, a cup full of fireflies. Wherever your hand is, wherever you're touching, the light follows you. Much different than just having it attracted to your ground mm -hmm. in, in, a, in a plasma field. Uh, and I mean that's the kind of thing that I'm I'm really interested in uh, these seeing things that do exist finding new ways of appropriating them and ju just keep on going that's a big plasma piece that I can't turn on to show you because it frightens the animal so much uh. <laughs> those are two liter neon bottles and they haven't been opened. So they've got two liters of gas in them. 
and they're being used as capacitors. And so, yeah, you probably recognize the 15,000 volt transformer. Mm -hmm. So that is going in parallel to those um, seven, uh, excuse me, six flasks. And at the tip of the arc that goes around, each one of those supports a live arc. So you get about a $60,000 burst of energy uh, that rotates with that huh. little commutator. I'll show you a video of that. Okay. Again, I'm sorry, but the, the animals go into, it puts out this high, high frequency yeah. and they just freak out. I forgot who was talking, but I think Ed was mentioning that when you're making pieces like that, you may not hear it, but some people like the young, oh, the yeah. young can hear it. Um, or even animals. Uh, I, I've been able to have the sensation of feeling yeah. that sensation sometimes. Well, we always used um, the, the, bat, the hair on the back of my hand to find out where there were leaky fields when I was working with a lot of neon. It, it was better than almost any kind of a gauge detector. I mean, it just mm -hmm. really lets you know a lot. Yeah. So uh, you you don't you don't work with neon in terms of bending it at all, do you? Well, in 1971, I installed the first neon shop in a college in America, which was at the Minneapolis College of Art and Design. And somebody had 500 bucks. They sold an entire shop, glass, everything, um, and. I had a couple of students. We went from, I was teaching there, mm -hmm. went up to, um, I think it was Mankato, Minnesota, picked it up and brought it back to Minneapolis and had uh, Ed Falk, who was a straight ahead um, GI Bill trained neon bender at a big sign company in Minneapolis that uh, had worked with the Walker Art Center. So, had been introduced to artists before and uh, the, the school was willing to pay him to yeah. install the shop and to teach three of us how to use it and that was the beginning of working with a lot of neon we, we had neon classes starting um 70 72 mm -hmm. and i taught two of the students to, to bend and uh, one of them still there Where's this at again? Minneapolis College of Art and Design. I'll keep that. I'll keep a note on that. <laughs> um, but then also, you again with the work that you're making, you like to also mess with kinetic work as well. So these yeah. these lighting mediums, even you also use LED as well to your uh, kinetic work or just sculpture in general. No, pretty much. If I could get candles to last long enough, I'd use them also. Yeah. I mean, some my. I guess the first time that I can recall being noticing light or being fascinated with light was being taken to Catholic masses when I was really young, you know, three years old, four years old, being bored to death and staring at the votive candles. And that was it. That was the only thing worth going to church for, was seeing this little bit of movement inside of these red and blue gold candles. Mm -hmm. And um, that's never left me. I mean, I would say that that's probably as much of an impetus for me to work today as there ever was. Uh, another one was, same period of time, in those days, you could go to the movies and sit in, in the loges, which are the last four or five rows in the theater, and you could smoke. And my parents, if they wanted to go out to a movie, they, they took me, and I was bored with that too, so I would turn around and look into the darkness at the back of the theater, and then you would see the tip of a cigarette all of a sudden just start to go from a little bit of an orange to a bright, bright red almost to a yellow and then you could see the smoke and then have it disappear 
back to nothing. Mm -hmm. And if you had eight to 10 smokers, it was a really cool light show. Very similar, I imagine, to like seeing night flies would be coming on and off in sort of a foggy zone. And so, so my inspiration for the work was never science specifically, mm. but what I saw, my f formal education in art, and uh, I, I, once I learned that this flyback transformer was developed by Tesla, um, I did all of the reading and research I could on him. And at mm -hmm. that time, there was several Tesla societies that were functioning beautifully and had great tinkerers. Mm -hmm. Is there something about light sculpture um, that you can say... Oh, that's not the right question. <laughs> um What could you say about light sculpture that tends to be, that would be the most important to consider? Um, well, to clarify, so I'll, get, I'll, I'll answer your question. So my, my background and my desire was to be involved in the world of fine art. Um, and so if I was a painter, and I was a fine artist, I wouldn't be doing portraits. I wouldn't be doing landscapes or seascapes. Uh, if I was a sculptor, I wouldn't be doing um, figures of a soldier on a horse for a memorial somewhere. So all of that is totally legitimate art, but it's very specific, and it usually ends up having a name connected to it. You know, watercolor, um, or, or again, like portraiture. And I wanted to work within the confines of fine art and be part of the, the Dadaist and the Surrealist and the Italian Futurist and Abstract Expressionism and the, the, the theoretical part of the art world that was coming along and, and developing and Abstract Expressionism, its relationship to poetry, to jazz. Um, so I, I want my work my, my color field pieces specifically um, to stem from my experience of Mark Rothko's paintings. Uh, from, I f first saw Rothko's paintings when I was very young uh, and they were luminous to me. They glowed. And when I saw that neon light reflected doesn't mix. Mm -hmm. You don't put yellow next to blue and get green. You have these colors that stay uniquely separated because mm -hmm. of a rather narrow frequency band, they don't mix. And I started doing these very, very simple squares and rectangles of two colors that um, could also, some would say, you know, they look very much like Joseph Albers' work. Mm -hmm. And f for me, these particular light pieces were about using light as a metaphorical language um, and about time and it, what experience is. Um, I've, I've lost lots of wonderful friends uh, in my life. And at, at this age, I'm going to be 75 in April, you know, my mom's dead, my dad's dead, grandmother, grandfather, uh, my two closest friends. And they are alive in me, my experience of them, um, my ability to palpably experience them is here, it's tangible. But I can't reach out and, and touch them. Mm -hmm. And so these sculptures that I make have this tangibility. When you see them, there is no denying their existence. But when you turn them off, they completely vaporize. It's just a blank wall. Mm. And I'm interested in that as, as part of the content of the work. I mean, even biblically, people you know, use terms of light and darkness in terms of life and death, etc. Um, 
and I, I don't get heavy about it. It's just, it's, it's for me. It's mm-hmm. what I'm interested in, and it's what I like to do with the pieces. And a, a couple of them have, um, have ended up in a, a meditation center um, in Japan. Okay. Which was a big compliment to me, because it's, it, it's really what I want them to do, to sort of hold you quietly. Mm-hmm. So, I guess... It kind of hold. Do you believe that? No, I don't want to say it that way. There's a, there's a specific way to say it, but can the adherence to a specific, spe, being very specific in terms of light art or light sculpture, can that limit the potential someone can have with making their art? Well, I because th- I, I I'm trying I'm, I'm kind of picking up and I understand fully this that I, I'm I'm, under, I'm understanding this is that um, I can get really tunnel visioned yeah. on the idea of making the plasma piece, um, but at the same time the work has to be able to stand without having the label on it, it focusing on the fine art. Yeah. Well, I've always shown with traditional, you know, painters, sculptors uh, represented by galleries and museums that just show art and not like a specific uh, genre of art. Mm. And and that's what I want. I want my work to have a dialogue with, uh, you know, a, a painting or, you know, a very contemporary idea. It do- doesn't matter what the material is, but... <laughs> It's the thought. Yeah. Um, and I'm happy with whatever people do that turns them on and gives them pleasure. Yeah. And I've certainly seen a lot of people that have crazy skill with uh, the plasma stuff. Um, the first person that I really saw take it to cool places was Sally Pratch. I mean, other than being just great person. Her um, watching her work because we were in we're at Pilchuck teaching at the same time was uh, like watching my grandmother cook. It's just so easy. Mm-hmm. I mean, she could talk to you, have a conversation about this band she saw last night, and be producing the most amazing, impossible things that were mm-hmm. all of a sudden possible right in front of you. Yeah, and. I, yeah, I mean, I enjoy seeing what people do. Um, it gets them turned on. They experience their own, you know, little nirvana. And I, I can't really comment on it. I, I know that there's, not in terms of plasma, but just, just in terms of the work with light, things like the, the Bay Bridge in San Francisco, I just see as an atrocity. Hmm. Or the top of the, um, I don't even know the name of the building. Um, uh, the tallest building in San Francisco has a um, what, what they refer to as a light sculpture. And I find all of it just offensive, beyond belief. It's, it's design. Mm-hmm. It's the, the programming on the Bay Bridge you can see on uh, on a screensaver on a, a kids game uh, but it's easy mm-hmm. and this is the age of easy nobody wants critical thinking nobody wants anything that's challenging um, I, I think the the birth of the digital era has produced many people who like easy because they don't need the background of information that's mm-hmm. necessary to actually appreciate whatever it happens to be. Wood carving, um, whale skin canoes. I mean, everything becomes so much more rewarding and gives back to you when you know something about it. Uh, and like when I started showing in New York City, like 1970, the collectors, the art dealers, and the artists were all in it together. Mm-hmm. The collector knew absolutely as much about art history as the 
dealer, the museum uh, director, and the artist. And that made for this amazing um, synergistic relationship and fun. I mean, totally cool. And I mean, since university education starting in about 1971 went from liberal arts to uh, basically vocational technical, you got all these people in the sciences and math, mm -hmm. great. They may be smart in science and math, but in terms of the history of the world, politics, art, music, food, language, culture, it's not there. And it's been replaced by huge volumes of money, absurd volumes of money to replace any criteria of quality other than a number. Mm. I'm really sorry for taking you way off into another <laughs> zone. I can't help it. But I feel even so that this tangent is in line with something here. Because, um, yeah, I, 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 listening to that, I do feel that. I don't know the connection between myself as someone who has, who is, an, who is claiming as an artist I might as well be it. I am as an artist with the audience, with the potential collector in the gallery space. That's it's like almost like disintegrated. Yeah. And I, you know, I'm also integrated into the Plasma Art Alliance, which is trying to look at a direction for having the work be shown. And for every reason, whether the barrier is self-imposed or the barrier is the audience not seeing past the electrical effects being scientific or museum-like, um, there is something that's creating these barriers, so no one's, no one's budging in, in the next step. Now, seeing that, like I mentioned, one thing is that, well, the people that we want to show it at are looking at it and looking at it as, oh, this is light art, it's, Electrical, electrical is scientific. Why don't you throw that into a museum space? In the context of that subject there, is it something we're approaching that differently, or should we just look at spaces that are, and show, just say we're, gonna show, we're putting in a show and not throw the detail like, oh, it's plasma, it does this and this and this? Uh, yeah, I just try to show with other artists. Of, of all different types of media. I mean, just get out there in the world of art. And, and right now there's a lot of people that are looking for work. They don't know what they're looking for because they're not particularly educated, so they're looking. And the mm -hmm. art fairs are a huge deal. You don't, I mean, it's, it's very intimidating for a lot of people to go to museums because they feel stupid. Mm, yeah. they, this this idea that you just go and you experience what there um, seems to have vaporized, and they don't like being around what they don't know. Yeah, because no one wants to feel like they are stupid or to be. Yeah, that's they don't want to feel like they're stupid when they walk into a space and and kind of don't understand what's going on. Yeah, but if you know if you're open to it, yeah, man, if you surrender to that work, it will do something to you. But not if you're standing there asking it to. Hmm. Again, going back to the friend thing, you don't walk in and say, be my friend. You're going to be my friend. You can't go up to a painting and say, I need to understand you to have this experience. Mm -hmm. When those experiences, like, you know, falling in love, you're not going to find that in a book. There's no instructions. It happens on a one-to-one -one level. And to this date, nobody knows what it really is. And we believe in it enough to do stupid stuff like get married and have children. Mm -hmm. So th within our own lives, we have these things that we believe in. You just have to move them to the left a little bit and you can drop into art and connect with it without asking any questions. At least that's what I think. 
It's funny, I don't have a follow-up question, which I'm not sure if that, I feel like I, that's a good idea, but. Well, I think, being that you're interviewing me, I, I don't feel too self-conscious going back to my own work. I'm interested in the pre-linguistic and pre-cognitive nature of light. And I mean, any mom or dad who's had infants, you know, kid may be in a cradle in the other room and all of a sudden they're making noise, they're being fussy, they're crying, and then there's a cry. And in, in a millisecond, you know that unlike all of the other cries, this is a hurt cry. Mm-hmm. And you're out of your seat and moving with light speed into that room. Nobody trained you. It doesn't matter if you're in China, Italy, Bolivia. When you hear that noise, you know it. And light is the same way. Everyone understands light and darkness and that the light that I'm most interested in is the edge of the two. Because the darkness, be it, you know, if you want to go back historically in terms of references to caves and moving into these spaces that continues to get darker and darker the farther you go, um, or the night, the sunset, all of it, everybody, every language, anywhere on the planet owns that stuff, was never taught that stuff. Mm -hmm. We own it. Our limbic system is riddled with it. I think when you work with things that you start to turn into forms, it's a different kind of approach. And I think probably easier in terms of finding an audience because these are objects that can be displayed in many cases easily. Mm -hmm. Um, And I've never really met people that don't like things that glow. I mean, Mm -hmm. light is friendly. An abstract painting can threaten the nature of light as we experience as abstract. Mm -hmm. So that's a real positive thing. And the other thing is, you you know, um, you should just do it. Try to, don't think about it too much. Just go out and stumble around and make something happen. It's amazing what happens when you put yourself out there. Mm-hmm. Not knowing, you don't have to know. If you know, you you've already ruined it. Yeah, <laughs> you got to return to that. Mo- I was thinking about this uh, a little bit. Uh, just the moment when you're a kid, right? The, the parents know how the movie's gonna end. They know it's gonna be a happy <laughs> ending. But every time, every movie you saw, you didn't think about how you've seen that movie millions of times before. The feeling of not knowing whether or not it's going to end well and being there in the, the the unfolding of the scene that that is where you know we get our bit of happiness or things are refreshed yeah and nowadays i have to kind of force myself to to be in that maybe sometimes it's the fault of the the production the production makes it too easy for me to predict it right but in other times the production's well enough that even though i know it's going to end well i'm captured by it enough that i forget that I know it's going to end well. Well, yeah, clearly that works for a lot of people because there's a lot of stuff out there to watch. Yeah. (laughs) Well, I don't want to drag this out too much longer. I do appreciate you giving the time and inviting me into your space to record today. Um, Any closing words on this subject? Um, Yeah, you know, it's... uh, My relationship to light is, again, it's... It's kind of emotional and really personal and, and based in, uh, I don't think you can call a candle or fire in a fireplace a natural phenomenon, but those type of experiences that um, everybody has, they just happen to ring my chimes. Mm. And to this day, the, the work that I'm doing, I'm doing a lot of work with marbles, uh, like, like kids' mm. glass marbles. Um, I loved marbles when I was a child. I never played marbles because I was never into any sport. Um, but I would put them in a 
cigar box and just look at them, touch them and hold them up to the light. And now I'm doing very large scale sculptures with uh, marbles that are um, connected to glass plates and um, illuminated in a way that the lenticular structure of the glass plate travels into the marble and they illuminate beautifully. And thanks so much for taking your time to talk with me. The outro is the process by Lakey Inspired. Jordan, a.k.a. Lakey, is a Los Angeles-based artist with the goal of inspiring others to create by sharing positive music around the world. Thus, he works hard to produce music every week for copyright-free use. So be sure to support his music by giving credit when used, subscribing, and or by donation via Patreon. You can find them on Instagram, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify. Thank you for listening to the Taming Lightning Podcast. I'd like to thank Cork Markeski for taking the time to record for the podcast, as well as Patrick Collentine for the introduction. We touched on a few art-themed topics that I would love to explore fully in their own episode. And if there was some takeaway, I would say to make the art you're very excited about, because that's the work that you'll put your best efforts to achieve. Also, I'd like to thank the Pittsburgh Glass Center for supporting me as a place of research and inspiration, as well as encouraging me to pursue this project. And the Plasma Art Alliance, where I have an access to a well of knowledge, it connects me to some amazing people. Last but not least, this trip was made possible through the support of the Advancing Black Arts in Pittsburgh grant provided by the Pittsburgh Foundation and the Heinz Endowments. If you'd like to support Taming Lightning, subscribe to the newsletter on www.taminglightning.net or follow on Instagram at Taming Lightning. Other options for support are donations through Coffee, ko spelled ko-fi.com slash Taming Lightning, where you can donate for the price of a $3 cup of coffee. Links will be provided in the show notes. Feel free to share, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you next time.